still remember the first time I heard the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas. She preached a sermon so powerful and so memorable that it forever changed the way I read the story from the Hebrew scriptures on the sacrifice of Isaac. On that evening at St. Augustine's of Hippo, Episcopal Church in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, Dr. Brown Douglas wrestled with the text in such a way as to call the black church to witness and the world to account for the violence done to young black boys. I sat up in the balcony of that historic black church as those in my pew called out the refrain, kick it Kelly, kick it, kick it Kelly, kick it, <laughs> as she boldly preached truth to power that was over 20 years ago. From the earliest days of her ordained life and academic career, Dr. Brown Douglas has been making the prophetic, homiletical, biblical, and theological case for the liberation of the black body. Her scholarship and perspective as a womanist black theologian has helped both the church and the academy make some sense of what God is up to concerning issues of profound concern to black people. And because issues of black sexuality in the church, the violence of standard ground culture, and the power of the black Christ have import for black people who are part of the body of Christ, it has import for all people. To say that Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas is a preeminent preacher and speaker and theologian, you have to understand that she comes by it honestly. She is a professor and director of religion program at Goucher College, where she has held the Elizabeth Connolly Todd Distinguished Professorship. She's been awarded the Goucher College Caroline Dublin Buckle Award for Outstanding Faculty Achievement. Prior to her appointment at Goucher College, she was for 14 years the Associate Professor of Theology at the Howard University School of Divinity. Dr. Brown Douglas graduated summa cum laude from Denison University and earned her Master's of Divinity and Doctorate of Philosophy degrees from Union Theological Seminary, where her preaching skills were lifted up early with the awarding of the Hudnut Award for Preaching Excellence and the Julius Hanson Award for Outstanding Student in Theological Studies. Her books, The Black Christ, A Womanist Perspective, Sexuality in the Black Church, What's Faith Got to Do with It, do with it? Black Bodies, Christian Souls, Black Bodies in the Black Church, A Blue Slant, and her most recent, Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God, are foundational foundational text for anyone hoping to understand and change the systems of oppression that overwhelmingly do damage to black and brown peoples. And because she has been a parish priest, serving at Holy Comforter for over 20 years, and now recently appointed as a canon theologian at the Washington National Cathedral, Dr. Brown Douglas has done the church and the world a great service by offering vigorous and accessible scholarship that speaks not only to the student in the ivory tower, but to the person in the pew and the activist on the protest line. It is my profound honor and privilege to introduce you to the Reverend Dr. Buchanan, Kelly Brown Douglas. Thank you. I am humbled by your introduction. Thank you. I say thank you humbly to my friend, sister friend, and colleague, the Reverend Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs. I have been blessed and enriched from the very moment that I arrived in your dear city and was picked up from the airport by Mr. Rory Smith. And I knew from that moment that my time here with you was going to be a blessing. And it has been. I want to deeply thank Reverend Fulton Porter and the Executive Committee of UBE for its gracious invitation to me to be here with you on this day. Even though it's Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> they say, I ain't gonna keep you long. <laughs> I'm a sports fan too. Oh, okay. But 
but it's a privilege to be in this historic parish. And I know that you all are blessed by his leadership and the leadership team. Amen. Amen. Yes. And what a blessing it has been for me to meet for the first time your bishop, bishop of our church, Bishop Lee. In the short space of time in which we got to speak with one another, I was deeply enriched by our conversation. And I know that this diocese is in more in good hands because I know that I met and have met a man of God. And so I thank you. So I say to you, yes. So I say to you, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Here we are, gathered on this last Sunday in Epiphany and first Sunday of Black History Month to celebrate, yes, the life and ministry of Absalom Jones, who, using the words of Black literary artist Zora Neale Hurston, threw up a highway in the wilderness so that those of African descent could in fact be here sitting in these pews, standing in this pulpit, and even serving at that altar as full members of this Episcopal Church family yet indeed recognized as sacred children of God. On that November Sunday in 1787, when Absalom Jones refused to be relegated to the far reaches of the balcony, do you think he could have ever imagined this day in this church or in Episcopal diocese across the land, including at this very time in the Washington National Cathedral? Do you think he could have ever imagined when priests, bishops, and lay alike, reflecting the diverse richness of God's creation, would ever come together in thanksgiving for his life and ministry. Yeah. For that matter, do you think he could have ever imagined that this Episcopal Church would have a presiding bishop so blessed with heavenly grace? Yeah. I don't think he could have. Oh, what a path he blazed for all of us that morning when he walked out of the doors of St. George's Methodist Church so that we could walk into the doors of this church and any church and pray in the pews without any danger of being yanked from our knees simply because of the color with which God has graced our skin. Amen. And so we rightly celebrate our brother Absalom Jones on this afternoon. Yet, even in so, so doing, we do so with a bit of irony. For even as we gather here inside of these church doors, one with another, without fear of denigration or degradation because of who God created us to be, a different reality exists for many outside of these very doors. And so how indeed are we to celebrate Absalom Jones with any integrity? And these are times when though he may no longer be yanked from his knees by church deacons or ushers, he may be shot to the ground by police officers because of the color of his skin. How are we to celebrate the one who in his January 1st, 1808 sermon that you had read, heard read, the one that proclaimed that the God who appeared in behalf of oppressed and distressed nations as the deliverer of the innocent is, he said, the same yesterday and today forever. How are we to celebrate this man, this preacher, this proclamation, yet a time when men, women, and children are still not free from deadly bigotry, hateful discourse, unwarranted fears because of their color, customs, culture, and creeds? How indeed are we to celebrate Absalom in such an age as this, in which the sacredness of our very humanity has been betrayed by our separation from and fear of one another. How are we to celebrate Absalom Jones on this day 
In these times of the LeBron McDonald, a Sarah Bland, a Freddie Gray, a Don Trey Hamilton, a Tanisha Anderson, a Tamir Rice, a John Crawford, a Eric Garner, a Walter Scott, a Michael Brown, a Jonathan Farrell, a Renisha McBride, a Jordan Davis, a Trayvon Martin, and the list could go on and on and on. How are we to celebrate Absalom Jones in these unsettling, if not terrifying times in which we now live? Well, yes. We have come a long way over the course of these 229 years since he first walked out of that church, but be not illusion. There is still much trouble in this land. And so how are we as a church, as a people, to celebrate our brother Absalom in a way that pays honor to his legacy and does not bring hollow in a nation that is still troubled by the color of life? Indeed, a nation even now alarmed by its own diversity. If we are to celebrate Absalom Jones on this day, in a way that heeds the challenges of his legacy, as one who freed himself from the bigotry, the biases, the prejudices, cultural, social, and even ecclesiastical principalities and powers that would prevent him from living fully into the life that God had given unto him to live, then we indeed must understand those principalities and powers that Absalom fought so that we, like him, might do the same in our time. For to do anything less is not only to betray his legacy, but to betray what it means for us to be a church, indeed what it means for us to be a people of God. And so on this afternoon, in this brief time before us, I want to seek to understand the very principalities and powers, if you will, against which Absalom fought, so to understand what it means for us to be a church in this time of the Laquans, the Sanders, the Renishas, and the Trevons. For here is the thing to know. The very culture that proclaimed that Absalom could not worship in the same space as white people, Indeed, the very culture that enslaved him is in fact the very same culture that robs the Laquans, the Saunders, the Renishas, the Trayvons of their lives. Yes. It is what I call a stand your ground culture. Now, it is important to understand the complex reality of this stand your ground culture if we are ever to realize the challenge of Absalom's legacy to us, which is the very call of what it means for us to be church. And so, in, again, this talk this afternoon, for this brief time before me, I want to try to explore the nature of this culture, to try to understand where it comes from and its, its implications for us as we sit here this afternoon. So travel, if you will, with me for a moment as we examine that which I call stand your ground culture. What is it? The notion of stand your ground culture entered the general public discourse at the time of Trayvon Martin's slang, almost now four years ago, in February 2012. In fact, I believe he was slain on February 26, 2012. While Stand Your Ground Law was a backdrop to the Trayvon Martin case, what happened to Trayvon and all the other young black men and women whose names I've called, as well as others whose names have not entered into the public discourse, what ha has happened to them goes beyond this law. Stand Your Ground Law is an extension of English common law that gives the person the right to protect his or her castle. You with me? Yes. Stand your ground law essentially broadens the notion of castle to include one's body. It permits certain individuals to protect their embodied castle whenever and wherever they feel threatened. In this regard, a person does not have to retreat from the place in which he or she is castled, they can stand their ground. 
Essentially, a person's body becomes her or his castle. Stand your ground law in this regard signifies a particular social cultural climate, that is, stand your ground cultural climate, which makes the degradation, destruction, and death of black bodies inevitable and permissible. In fact, this culture predates the law itself. Stand your ground culture has produced and sustained slavery, black codes, Jim Crow, lynching, and other forms of racialized violence on black bodies. It is, as I said, the very culture that made Absalom Jones' treatment in St. George's Methodist Church inevitable. This culture has its origins in the grand narrative and legitimating religious canopies that define our very nation. Again, in this short space of time, I can't fully cover the complex and interlocking web of this grand narrative, it, and as, long, as well as the caricatures and stereotypes of Islam. I will therefore discuss it in broad strokes, so to again provide the social historical context for what it means for us to be church today, and what it means for us to celebrate Absalom. The roots church of Stanley Brown culture were sown with the arrival of the first Americans to this soil, pilgrims and Puritans alike. In 98 CE, a Roman historian named Cassius published what has been called one of the most dangerous books ever written. It was named Germania. In a brief space of 30 pages, he offered an ethnological perspective that would have tragic consequences for centuries to come. It is the racial specter behind Stand Your Ground culture. Germania provides a meticulous portrait of, he says, an Aboriginal people, a people, he says, that were free from all taints of intermarriages, with, he described, fierce blue eyes, red hair, huge frames, who possessed, he says, good moral instincts, a peculiar respect for individual rights, and an almost instinctive love, he says, for freedom. Tacitus' ethnological description spawned the construction of the Anglo-Saxon myth. This myth has been a ubiquitous, even if it is unspoken and unacknowledged, ideology in the modern world. Initially, this myth highlighted Anglo-Saxon forms of governing and stressed the unique superiority of Anglo-Saxon religious and political institutions. Eventually, and perhaps inevitably, this myth shifted its focus to Anglo-Saxon blood. In so doing, it suggested that the superiority of religious and political institutions was a result of Anglo-Saxon blood. It argued that strong moral qualities and high regard for freedom flowed uniquely through Anglo-Saxon veins. Now, this myth, replete with reverence for Tacitus, arrived in America by way of England's post-Reformation struggles. It arrived with the Puritans and the Pilgrims as they fled from the Church of England to build a nation they believed more befitting of Anglo-Saxon virtue and freedom. They considered themselves, the Puritans and the Pilgrims, considered themselves the Anglo-Saxon remnant that was continuing a divine undertaking, tracing their mission beyond the woods of Tacitus, Germany, to the Israelites in the Bible. From its earliest beginnings, get this, from its earliest beginnings, America's social political identity with a re legitimating religious canopy was an Anglo-Saxon identity. America's sense of democracy and freedom was inextricably linked to the Anglo-Saxon myth and Tacitus Germany. This was a myth that greatly influenced the father of American democracy, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, make no mistake about it, was a thoroughgoing and unapologetic Anglo-Saxonist to the point of studying Anglo-Saxon language and grammar and insisting that it be taught in the university. 
He told his granddaughter that Tacitus' book was one of the best he had ever read. In short, through political architects such as Jefferson, because other founding fathers themselves were unabashed Anglo-Saxons, through the architects such as Jefferson, America's democracy was conceived as an expression of Anglo-Saxon character. From its earliest beginnings, therefore, America's social political identity with a legitimating religious canopy was an Anglo-Saxon identity. Its sense of democracy and freedom was inextricably linked to the Anglo-Saxon myth. The city on the hill that the early Americans were building was nothing less than a testament to Anglo-Saxon chauvinism. Hence, the grand narrative that defines America is that of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. And it is this narrative that demands a stand-your-ground culture in order to sustain itself. You still with me? <laughs> For in order to sustain itself, America's defining narrative, that Anglo-Saxon myth, produced the ideology of white supremacy, what W.E.B. Du Bois described as the wages of whiteness. <laughs> Subsequently, in an effort to validate the notion of white supremacy, and hence protect the wages of whiteness, which express themselves as oppressive power endowed with rights that only white bodies can enjoy. In order to protect that, a stand your ground culture was born. Stand your ground culture is intimately connected to the ideology of white supremacy as it is meant to protect one of the most significant wages of whiteness, free space. As slavery established, free space is white space. Moreover, white space is wherever the white body is cast. In sum, from its Puritan and Pilgrim beginnings, Anglo-Saxon power has formed an intricate cultural web of interactive narratives and discourse to sustain itself or at least to maintain the illusion of America's Anglo-Saxon identity. This web began with the grand narrative of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. In the end, the black body has become entrapped in this web as it ultimately constructs it as a criminal body, always guilty of something, and thus making clear that the black body does not belong in free space. This construct of the criminal body was likewise established in slavery. The black body as chattel is the specter from slavery that has the greatest impact upon black people's current social political realities. Again, it was firmly established within America's collective consciousness during slavery, and it remains a pervasive part of America's consciousness today. It has just taken a different form, perhaps more appropriate to the social historical context. The 21st century version of the chattel construct is the criminal black body. The black body that was once marked as chattel is now marked as criminal. This construct serves the same purpose as the construct of chattel. It relegates the black body to an unfree space. This construct of the criminal body has been sustained in the 20th, 20th and 21st century the same way it was sustained in post-emancipation post -emancipation America through the racially biased laws of staying your ground culture, such as the drug laws, stop and frisk, and the staying your ground law itself. Michelle Alexander has called the prison industrial complex the new Jim Crow. She is right in the sense that it does, as she says, function as a well-designed system of racialized social con control in a manner strikingly similar to Jim Crow. 
The laws that have been generated to ensure a majority black and prison population certainly are updated versions of Jim Crow law. Nevertheless, the prison industrial complex, I believe, is about more than the Jim Crow laws that make it work. This complex attempts to reinstall in a more acceptable 21st system, system manner the same system that Jim Crow was developed to reinstate. The prison industrial complex harkens back to slavery. It maintains the narrative of slavery that the black body is not meant to be free. It virtually re-enslaves the black body by putting it behind bars. If the black criminal is the new chattel, the industrial prison complex is the new slaveocracy. The industrial prison complex is the institutional manifestation of stand your ground culture. And to reiterate, this culture does its job when it removes the black body from the white space, a free space, and returns it to the black space, an unfree space, in a way that seems reasonable and unbiased. What makes the transformation from chattel to criminal complete is the insinuation of the image of the black body as criminal into the American collective consciousness. Yeah. When this is done, the black body and the criminal body become virtually synonymous. And thus, to see, for instance, a black male body is to see a criminal body. There was no greater example of this than what happened, I believe, to 12-year-old Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio. It was impossible for the white police officer to see Tamir as the child that he was. The officer saw a threatening 21-year-old criminal man. It is interesting to note that Ohio has an open carry law, meaning it is legal to carry a gun in public. So even if the officer thought Tamir was 21, as he said he did, Tamir had a right to carry a gun. What is clear, however, is that the right to carry a gun, concealed or not, is a right accorded only to white bodies, and certainly not the innately criminal black bodies. The right to carry a gun is, as W.E.B. Du Bois would say, a wage of whiteness. It should also be noted that the black female body has been criminalized as well, perhaps in a more gender-specific way. The black female is often portrayed as criminally immoral, and most times mean and angry the violent girl, and hence, a Sandra Bland appears threatening regardless. The cultural production of America's narrative of exceptionalism has done its job as it protects white space by violating the freedom and sometimes ending the lives of young black men and women with impunity. Essentially, the white space, wherever the white body is castled, stands its ground against all non-white intrusion. It was in protection of white space that Absalom Jones was removed from his knees of prayer. And so, what does all of this mean for us as a church on this day and that we celebrate Absalom Jones' legacy? Before I suggest a couple of things, let me make one thing perfectly clear. America's standing ground culture, with all of its racialized productions, is sin. Indeed, America's original sin is its founding narrative of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. Sin is that which alienates humans from the very ways and will of God, reflects a breach with God and what God stands for. Standing ground culture reflects such a breach in many ways. Essentially, the way in which the early Americans, that is the Pilgrim and Puritans, as well as the Founding Fathers, constructed the identity of this nation is consequential. It has virtually meant that this nation, our nation, has been held captive to sin. In other words, the fruit of the sinful narrative of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, which our, our social, political, economic systems and structures are themselves sinful realities, realities that alienated us from the very 
justice of God. For the manifestation of salvation from the sin of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism is nothing less than the reality of God's justice. Salvation equals justice. And so what does this mean for all of us? God's justice means a restoration of the sacred dignity of all people. This begins with the crucified class of people. It matters, church, that Jesus died on the cross, just as it matters that God freed the Israelites from bondage. It matters, as Absalom Jones said in his 1808 sermon, that God appeared in behalf of oppressed and distressed nations as the deliverer of the innocent. For it is only when the oppressed, only when the least of these, are free to achieve the fullness of life that God has given them, that God's justice will be realized. The profound meaning of God's preferential option for freedom is seen in God's solidarity, in absolute solidarity, with crucified classes of people. Their freedom will mark an eradication of all that separates people one from another and thus disengages all people from the goodness of their humanity. Thus, the justice of God always, always begins from the bottom up. Put simply, it is in the freedom of those who crucify that one can see the justice of God working in the world. Recognition of this has implications, of course, for the church. For whatever the justification may be, historically the dominant religious community has been reluctant to respond, causing it to be ambivalent, if not antagonistic, in their responses regarding matters that pertain to race. This includes our own Episcopal communion as well. The cross has indeed been a stumbling block for many churches when it comes to matters of race. In this instance, it prevents far too many churches from seeing the reality of Jesus' crucifixion in their very midst. They stumble when it comes to recognizing the face of the crucified Jesus that is perhaps not privileged, perhaps not white. What this means is that the crucified Jesus is virtually ignored. The challenge for all churches in this regard is to step out of the space of cultural privileged whiteness to be where Jesus is, and that is with the crucified classes of people in our time and in our day. This means to step into the space of the Trayvons and the Jordans the Renishas and the Sambas, who don't know whether, as Trayvon's mother said, to walk slow or to walk fast, who don't know whether to be calm or to be loud in order to stay alive. Yeah. And so, we as a church, and particularly as a black church, must follow the lead not of far too many churches who abandon the crucified classes of people in our midst, than those people being disproportionately black and brown. Instead, we must follow the lead of Absalom Jones and the Free African Society as it cared for widows, children, the sick, the needy, and the helpless. As the Free African Society was an oasis in the middle of a forest world where neglected and otherwise abandoned black bodies could experience, at least in the Free African Society, they could experience at least a foretaste of God's promised future. As the Free African Society was that, so must we be as church. We must be a place, if we are to call ourselves church, we must be a place where black lives matter, and hence where black lives are cared for. And moreover, we must be a place where all oppressed peoples are welcomed and recognized as sacred children of God who deserve to be treated as such, regardless of the way they look, where they live, the language they speak, or who they love. To do anything less would be to 
betray the legacy of Absalom, which is nothing other than the legacy of what it means to be church and indeed of what it means to be a people of God. But our work does not stop here. For we must recognize that the systems and structures that are the fruit of standing ground culture, systems and structures that limit employment, housing, educational, health care, even recreational opportunities for non-white bodies, these systems and structures in their sinfulness are violent. They are crucifying realities that do harm to bodies and limit, if not destroy, life possibilities. Stand your ground culture produces violent systems and structures. It fosters conditions of living that nurture death, not life. And so it is no wonder that we see disproportionately higher rates of crime and homicide in certain communities amongst black males, for this is the violence that violence produces. As churches, as people of God, we must stop the violence at its source, which means demanding a change in these inequitable systems and structures. Because for now, they are doing their job. They are destroying black lives. To do anything less than to demand a change and an end to these systems and structures is for us to be complicit with the shouts of those who cry, crucify him, crucify him. At the same time, we must work to provide the resources of support, both material and non-material, for those who are trapped in these conclaves of death so that they are able not only to survive, but to survive with dignity and are also able to thrive. As Brian Stevenson reminds in his wonderful book on redemption, the solution to poverty is not wealth. The solution to poverty is justice. And I had God's justice. But then there is another level of response. I do believe that real change starts from the bottom up. Hence, we must change the web of relationships of power from below in order to change power relationships from above. As I often say, unjust dominating power trickles down. Change radiates up. Thus, churches must lead the way in changing those relationships by having the difficult conversations about race and all that it means in this nation. As I come to an end, let me share this. After the decision not to indict the officer involved in Jameer Rice's killing, along with the decision to hold no one accountable for Simon Glenn's death for now, my son, now 23, as of a couple of days ago, came to me and asked what I thought about this. I asked him what he thought. He said that he wasn't surprised and he just figures that this is the way it is and black people just have to get used to it and try not to put themselves in situations where policemen can kill them. <clears throat> Needless to say, my son and I engaged further in conversation about this matter of race. <laughs> I should add that, that my son was once stopped uh, on a dark road going back to college simply for driving while black, as even his white attorney noted. And so we often have these conversations about race and these conversations about how to keep, him, keep himself safe and alive. And it was one of those conversations that kept him alive on that, that dark night. Anyway. As I had this conversation with my son, it led me to wonder what conversations white parents are having with their children. <coughs> Black parents and children cannot avoid the conversations of race. One thing I do know, if things are going to change, then white parents must have the conversation of race with their children. Yes. And again, the church can and must help with that. So now, let me return to the question. How are we to celebrate Absalom Jones on this day in our time? I have come to believe that this time of ours is perhaps like it was for Absalom, a Kairos time. That is a decisive moment in history. 
that potentially has far-reaching impact. A Kairos time is a time where through chaos and crisis, God is fully present, disrupting things as they are, so to provide an opening to a new way of being in the world, a new way of being with one another, and even a new way of being with God. And so it seems to me that it is not about asking how are we to celebrate Absalom Jones. Rather, it is about declaring that we must celebrate Absalom on this day and in these our times. For from a pew in Philadelphia some 229 years ago, to a sidewalk in Sanford, a street in Ferguson, a gas station in Jacksonville, a porch in Detroit, a neighborhood in Charlotte, a street in Ferguson, a corner in Staten Island, a store aisle in Dayton, to a park in Cleveland, to a road in Texas, to a street here in Chicago. God is disrupting things as they are and calling us to a new way of being in this our world, a new way of being with one another, and even a new way of being with God, and indeed a new way of being church. And so we must celebrate Absalom Jones on this day by walking through these doors into this world that is ours and in the words of St. Thomas Church of Philadelphia's stated intent to arise out of the dust and shake ourselves and throw off that servile fear and be not consoled, be not comfortable, be not content, church, until God's justice is done. Let us leave this place committed to carrying forth the legacy that was Absalom Jones. Let us leave this place bound and determined not to be a social institution that happens to be religious, but to indeed be the church, be the church that was Absalom, be the church that is of God. Thank you.